Well, I'll just jump in there and say you were asking where we've we been shooting. I have been out shooting for the last three days out in Olympic National Park on the wilderness beaches. It was fantastic. Wonderful. Yeah, we've had a couple of people said that they've been shooting in-house. Um, one gentleman said that he was out, where was he? In there. Someone was shooting a moon set in San Francisco. Uh, and then another gentleman did an overnight trip in Northern Arkansas, shooting waterfalls and landscapes. Uh, and otherwise he's just focusing on improving his Photoshop skills. So he's retired, this quarantine comes easy. Okay, good, good plan. Time. So a lot of you guys were here with us last month, but I'm going to introduce our speaker again anyway, because he's quite impressive. Uh, Randall J. Hodges is an all-in camera shooter. And that, makes, that means that he makes all of his adjustments in the field using tangible tools like Singray's lens filters instead of using post-processing and software. He has been a full-time professional photographer for almost 20 years, and he has his own galleries in Washington and Oregon. Most of his work comes from time spent hiking and backpacking the wilderness areas of the Western U.S., where he's hiked and photographed how many miles? 33,150. There we go. That number goes up every time. Randall's work has been published more than 4,500 times worldwide in books, magazines, calendars, newspapers, and more. If you want to see more of his work, check out the links in the chat window, or you can look for his book, which is titled Images of the West, a full color landscape photography book featuring 20 years of his all in camera photography of the West. And with that, Randall, I'm going to hand it off to you and I'll just let you know as questions come through. That sounds great. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome back to those who caught me in part one of this two part series and welcome to all the new people just jumping in and joining. And I'll just start out, uh, just to clarify a little, I'll give a little bit of a, a backstory to what I mean by all in camera. Um, for me, all in camera means starting with setting up the camera. I access the color palettes to the camera. I set them up to ma match my old slide films that I used to shoot. I shot a lot of Kodak, Ektachrome, uh, Elite Chrome, Kodachrome. And most people don't know that all digital SLRs and mirrorless cameras have up to 10 of these digital color palettes in them. But these cameras all come out of the box set to zero color. For most cameras, that means they're pushing somewhere between 5% of their total potential. Um, I jack my cameras up to the, where they're pushing uh, 90 to 100% of their potential. And I, I don't do... know how far you wanted to dive into it, but we've already had someone ask if you can discuss the camera settings um, and the color settings that you use. So I don't know if you were going to dive into that tonight. Or... Um, I'm going to save that for after when it may make a little bit more sense after we get into my actual shooting style. But okay. yes, we can tuck in there a little bit there. more. Okay. And uh, I shoot a Canon 5D SR. Uh, I have three of the bodies. I just tripled down and bought a body before they ran out of stock permanently. As everything is moving to mirrorless, I want to stay with my 50 megapixel camera I call the Image Monster. I control the white balance in the camera. Of course, the aperture, the shutter speed, the ISO. And I use uh, only two kinds of filters for the most part. Uh, I use the Singray light bright warming polarizers on all my lenses uh, during the day. And at sunrise and sunset, I use the Galen Rowell graduated split neutral density filters to balance light. And I'm always carrying two full set sets, uh, one, two, three, and four stop. I only carry it in hard. I also carry the Randall J. Hodges Mountain V filter, uh, the Mountain V1 and the Mountain V2, especially in the summertime when I'm up high in the mountains. Uh, everything is shot on a tripod and everything is shot using old school film techniques. Uh, the images you'll see on the screen today or if you visited either the Randall J. Hodges Photography Gallery in Edmonds, Washington or the images of the West Gallery by Randall J. Hodges in Cannon Beach, Oregon, they would all represent what you would see in the back of my camera if you were standing next to me out in the field. So this particular adventure I'm going to tell you a little story about is called The Enchantments. And that's the uh, picture you're looking at right now is looking over Perfection Lake. Uh, 
in the middle of the enchantments and all the trees you see there, some on the East Coast might call those tamarack. Out here, we mostly call them larch. And right now we'd call them golden larch in this photo because they, their leaves turn gold and the needles fall off. This is an extremely difficult place to get a permit for. If I remember my figures right, they gave out 985 core permits. We call this area the core enchantments for overnight. Um, they gave out 985 and I believe 37,000 people applied for those permits. So I did not get one at original permit time in February and they give out the results in March. But I did score a permit on what you call a second chance walk up permit. And that's part of the fun story here. So uh, a shout out to my two buddies who joined me on this epic backpacking adventure in case they're listening, uh, Randy Gamar and Brian Moore. We were all on our separate computers between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. on a particular Monday. That's when they're going to randomly release the walk-up permits for the week. And I think my two other buddies had already given up. We hadn't seen any permits come through. We already had a whole nother trip planned. Uh, my van was packed up, ready to go for a big trip in the North Cascades. But I got it in my head that at 859 59.59, they'd be funny and they'd release all the core permits. So at 8.59.59, I pushed enter and sure enough, 16 permits popped up. I grabbed three of them just like that before I could even pay for them. The permits were gone and we were going to the enchantments. And so I had to call my buddies and say, scratch those plans, pack your backpacks, we're going to the enchantments. So that's how we started out this big adventure by somehow scoring up here in the Northwest, we'd call that a miracle lottery permit achievement. So what happens if you visit and you don't have a permit? It's a $5,000 fine and six months oh. in jail. Yeah, it's not a little one. Nope. And you can visit on a day hike, but a day hike is 20 miles with a 6,000 foot elevation gain and loss. And there are plenty of people who do it. It's like a marathon to a day hiker to be able to do the enchantments in a day. But as you see, as we go through these photos for a photographer, doing it in a day just won't do. You really need to carry a backpack up there. And where this picture is taken is very close to where my first shot of the trip was taken. And it, that was uh, 14 and a half miles with 6,000 feet elevation gain carrying a 62 pound pack. And to say I was almost crawling up to the photo spot wouldn't be an exaggeration. All right, let's get this party started. We'll move on here to the first photo of the trip. Um, this is the back of Known Tarn. For 25 years, I've wanted to get a picture of Prissick Peak and Gnome Tarn with the Golden Larch. I even made it up here one year before, uh, but there was already two feet of snow on the ground and this tarn was frozen, so no shot for me. Uh, this was just a quick shot as I was getting out my camera. I saw this reflection of the golden larch against the back of Prissick Peak. So I zoomed in on that. Aperture priority F20. It is a one second exposure, one stop dark ISO 100 in my standard roll of film, which I'll talk more about. White balance 6400K. I used a two-stop graduated split neutral density filter over the top to balance the light between the top of our picture and the reflection in the water. So where did you place the split on that filter? Pretty much right through the trees, right to the water. Okay. To make it disappear. All right, and let's get our first view of Prissick Peak and Gnome Tarn. That's a shot I've been chasing my whole career. And this isn't the one that is in the galleries, but this was the first shot and I was already very excited and all those miles and all that trouble was worth it. Uh, aperture priority F20, eight tenths of a second in at one stop dark ISO 100 in my landscape roll of film, which I've set up to match Kodak Elite Chrome slide film, white balance 6400K and that three stop graduated split neutral density filter and hard graduation, again, pretty much sitting right at the water line in there. Now we'll bump up to the next slide and you'll just see the colors come on a little bit more. Same techniques used here. The only thing that changed is it got a little later, my shutter speed uh, increased to 1.6 seconds, but all my other technical stayed the same. And let's bump up to the gallery shot. 
full alpen glow. Uh, same technique again, but now you can see it's gotten later. I, that's a full F20, eight second exposure, one stop dark, ISO 100, landscape roll of film, that white balance, I bumped it down just a little bit to 6200K. I really wanted to keep those pinks pink and that blue blue in the back there. Three stop graduated split neutral density filter. Can you answer real quick, what does one stop dark mean? So some people shoot in auto, some people shoot in shutter priority, which means you select the shutter, the camera will help you out with the best aperture it can. But I believe as a landscape photographer, we should shoot an aperture priority. That means we select the aperture and the camera will help us with a shutter speed. Well, the camera helped me with this shutter speed and it was 16 seconds and the photo was uh, overexposed. So I forced the camera one stop dark in exposure compensation and took that second shot at eight seconds. Uh, you can do the same thing in manual while you are setting the aperture and you just have to keep pushing that shutter speed around until you think it's exposed correctly. You end up in the exact same place. In my opinion, aperture priority is faster. I can usually get there in one or two shots. So for me as a landscape photographer, aperture priority is the way to go. In this picture, where did you focus? Oh, that's a great question. So since I don't do any focal stacking, no focal blending, I am always focused somewhere in my foreground. However, you cannot focus on a reflection or you cannot focus is something underwater. So if you see the first rock on the left side of the photo, that's my focus point. When trying to create a big depth of field, you wanna to try to keep your focus in the front or the foreground of your picture. I always say about five to 10% in, we're allowed what we call little back focus. That means we can focus a little past and we'll still be in focus. But if we go much more than 10% into the photo, we're gonna start getting soft in that foreground. And so what, was, what was your metering mode? Oh, uh, evaluated metering with a digital camera. We don't have to spot meter or pick a place to meter. We can with our eyeballs, we can see the picture and we can either brighten or darken the exposure from there. In film days, where you picked a meter was extremely important or you might have held a old handheld meter out there and ran around and tried to do an average metering. But with a digital camera, I just use my eyes. Now, since I'm an all-in camera shooter, I do not, never look at my histogram. I am only looking at the photo. And I know for some of you post-processors out there, you probably just, oh, what? You mm -hmm. probably, some of you probably live off your histogram, but that, that is for post-processing and it is correct for you to look at that histogram if you're gonna do post-processing to make sure you, one, haven't blown out any highlights or you haven't lost anything in the shadows. But for an all-in-camera shooter, that's not very important. It's more important that my eye likes the photo I presented. And our next question, same person. Um, or no, different person, sorry. Why are you adjusting the white balance manually instead of using auto or cloudy, et cetera? Okay, so cloudy is a setting. Cloudy is 6,000K. You can see in this photo, I'm at 6,200K. Um, and the reason I don't use auto, it's my opinion that auto white balance is off by nearly a thousand points either in either direction but it never sits in the pocket of what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to achieve. So uh, the, one of the first things, if you come out for a class, I'm gonna teach you to go to your white balance. Now, if you have a crop sensor camera, more than likely you're gonna work in symbols, uh, which in my class would be direct sunlight, 5,200K, cloudy, 6,000K, or shady, 7,000K. But if you have a little bit more expensive camera, you can just go to K and you can select a number from basically 1,000 to 10,000. So you have all that play for your white balance. Uh, I just was out shooting on the Olympic National Co Coast Wilderness Beaches. I had my white balance as low as 3,500 and I had it as high as 10,000 during that, that three day shoot. So that's how far my white balance will go. There's a big difference between shooting in an overcast day as shooting direct sunlight, as shooting late evening sunlight as shooting in shade. Those are all completely different lights and the white balance needs to be adjusted to compensate for that. All right, let's bump forward to the next slide, although I hate to leave the gallery shot, but we must move on. 
And I stayed out this night, uh, sipping what I love to call a mountain cocktail and taking a long exposure star photo. So this is bulb F4, 50 minutes, ISO 100 in that landscape roll of film, white balance set to 5,000K when you do star photos. You really gotta bump that white balance down. And it'd be very rare I would use any filter on a star photo, but because I was trying to balance the light in the reflection, I did have a one-stop split neutral density filter on there. And basically, uh, make sure you turn on long exposure noise reduction on your camera if you're gonna do it all in camera like me, and uh, lock that camera open in bulb F4, and just go sit down and watch the world turn for a while and hope you did everything right. This one turned out pretty good. I was pretty happy with it. So how do you know which manual white balance settings to use for the various landscapes and time of day? Oh, it's always a great question. If you came out for one of my classes, within the first two or three hours, you're gonna get a white balance uh, a test. I'm gonna ask you to shoot your white balance at 5,000K, 6,000K, 7,000K, or sunny, cloudy, shady, and tell me which one is closest to what you like. If you tell me, oh, I like the 7,000K or the, the shady, I'm gonna say, okay, now try 6,800 and then try 7,200 and make sure you've really pinpointed that. But the only way to really get to know white balance is to practice it. And the best way to practice it is go way off the chart. I mean, really, you could go, if, you, if you're shooting in K, do 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 K on the same composition, and you will learn what white balance is doing to the temperature of the color your camera is pushing. So when you're doing that, will the white balance changes be apparent with live view? They are apparent with live view. However, uh, I prefer my students don't shoot in live view. Um, live view is not the photograph, so it can steer you a little bit wrong. It's also slightly delayed, so when you're setting a polarizer or you're setting a split neutral density filter, sometimes you can tend to overset it and not know it. Uh, but when you click the photo, you go back and look at the photo and you're like, oh, that's a little different than live view. So I do have some students, of course, that shoot mirrorless cameras. They're basically looking at live view all the time. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're on a DSLR, I still like to look through the viewfinder, take a photo and analyze the photo. Uh, all I really use live view for is to pinpoint focus because you can turn on live view and you can zoom right into that foreground. And I use a little thing called a loop, which is a little uh, like you would use on a slide table on the back of my camera. And I can literally focus on one grain of sand. It is so accurate and sharp. And then I turn off live view and shoot as normal. Well, so, I know everyone's going to ask what loop it is. Do you want to? Yeah, it's a hood man. All right. That's what I recommend. And that will make you a, twice as good of a photographer without doing anything else, simply because you'll be able to see the back of your screen much clearer and you'll be much more accurate. All right, okay. let's move on here. We actually have a couple questions regarding that pick. Okay, let's um, do it. Was that image shot in total darkness or around dawn? No, that was shot in total darkness. However, the image was started at the very tail end of blue hour, which for a long exposure, I think is really important if you wanna retain a little bit of that blue tone in your sky. If you wait until the sky is already black dark, you're gonna have a brown tone in your sky. And I really like the blue tone. Um, often I'll, I'll start these at the very tail end of that alpenglow, so I can even capture a tiny bit of pink in there. but. On this day, uh, if we go back to the last one, I milked that shot well beyond Alpenglow. And so uh, I usually like to wait until there, I can count about 12 stars in the sky. It's not full dark, but you can see 12 stars. Go ahead and start that long exposure. It's gonna get dark during the exposure and you're gonna retain that nice uh, lighter blue tone in your sky. So during that 50 minute exposure, do you have problem with the sensor overheating? Never have, never once, and I've gone much, much longer uh, than that. Um, it is a question I'm asked quite often. I will admit, I've only ever shot on a Canon digital camera myself, but I've never seen one of my students' cameras overheat either, and I get all brands in my class. So that's just my two cents on that. Yeah. All right. When you take well, long exposures like this, 50 minutes, what are you doing? 
you just like sit around waiting? Oh, I'm packing a backpacking chair. <laughs> and, and I sit down to enjoy the view and I make a mountain cocktail. I mean, I earned it. I hiked 14 and a half miles. Took me about 10 hours to get to this spot. That's what I do. I sip a Worked cocktail. Hard. <laughs> Worked very, very hard. All right, on to the next slide here. And before I talk about this particular one, I just want to say a little something about everybody who does post-processing out there. I am not a hater. Uh, a lot of people think because I do it all in camera, I think I'm better than them or something. Absolutely not. Uh, there's one absolute rule in photography, and that is there is no absolute rule in photography. And I strongly believe that no matter what your method is, whether you're trying to do it all in camera or you're blending 30 images together and spending 10 hours in Photoshop or Lightroom on it doing post-processing, if it makes you happy, then you're doing it right. So the only way to do photography right is your way. And as long as you're happy, then good for you. All right, so uh, this is what I've dubbed the uh, enchanted forest in all of its golden large glory. And this is reflected in Perfection Lake here. And I spent, um, me and my buddy spent a magical two and a half, three hours shooting in this forest uh, while it was still trapped in shade before the morning light got fully up on it. It's an experience I will have the rest of my life. I, I came out of that forest so jacked up. I was so happy to be a photographer. Uh, shot this one at F20, eight tenths of a second is the exposure two-thirds of a stop dark. You'll notice almost all my exposures are a little dark. I just like that little extra pop from being a little dark. Uh, ISO 100, that standard roll of film in my white balance 5900K. Now I switch from my landscape roll to my standard roll because my landscape roll is the hottest roll of film I have. Or Every time I say roll of film, of course, I'm talking digital color palette, but I'm old school, so we'll call it a roll of film. Um, the landscape pushes the most color, which is fantastic for sunrise or sunsets. But when you get into some fall color, I still want the yellow tones to be yellow, the greens to be yellow, and the reds to be yellow, red. Sometimes my landscape will push those yellows a little bit too orange. And so I have to back off to my standard roll of film, which for me matches Kodak Ektachrome rather than Kodak Elite Chrome is kind of the difference there. I'm using that uh, light bright warming polarizer and my so one shot, if, if you had a frog or a fish that came up and caused ripples, would it straighten out over 50 minutes or what would happen? Well, this is only an eight tenths of a second photo. Okay. Uh, so uh, no, that would show and I'd have to let them, it calm or maybe capture the ripples by raising the ISO and speeding it up. But no, I was looking for glass on this. I really, okay. really wanted that. And then we'll move, this is gonna be a little series in the forest here. So the technique will be pretty much the same. We kind of named this whale rock here, this ginormous boulder. Uh, aperture priority F20, eight tenths of a second, one stop dark, ISO 100. That standard roll of film and the white balance 5900K using that uh, light bright warming polarizer with a one stop grad to balance light again from top to bottom, just trying to trying to make that a good mirror, as close to a mirror as I could possibly get. And in this one, just uh, for focusing, there is no immediate foreground. So I am focused on the very first rock right there in front of the whale rock. We'll keep up with that golden larch, one more reflection. Um, exact same uh, technique here, except the day's getting a little brighter. My shutter speed dropped to six tenths of a second from eight tenths, but everything else the same as we move our way around the lake here. And now we're heading right into the, that enchanted forest. I love this little path in the, in the summer when it's all green or when the fall, when it's golden, I will hike this one mile of trail back and forth. It's just so magical to me. Uh, aperture priority F20, six tenths of a second, one full stop dark, ISO 100 that standard color palette in the 5900K with just a polarizer on. There's nothing to balance here as far as light top to bottom. So just a polarizer focusing. Um, I'm on the one, two, three, four, fifth rock in that foreground and that's where my pinpoint focus is. And you can see that's a perfect focus point because the tree on the left, those needles are nice and sharp and all the way through at F20 is nice and sharp. Um, 
they're really, I know some people believe that you have to focal stack these days, but you know, photography did it without focal stacking for its whole lifetime until just the last 10 years. So with, with a good eye for focus and not getting your camera too close to your subject, you can easily get it done in one exposure. What lens did you use on this? Is it this, is my, this is my 24 to 105 okay. lens, and it is the only lens I packed on this trip. However, I will tell you the agony of leaving the wide angle lens in the van, but the wide angle lens weighs, you know, going on three pounds. So when you're carrying a 62 pack, pound pack already, you're talking about putting three more pounds on there and hauling it for 14 and a half miles up 6,000 feet elevation gain. Oh, I hate to go anywhere without it, but you can't get the photos if you can't make the hike. So there are some sacrifices. Now, some might say, hey, but you kept packed a cocktail. Why didn't you pack your lens? Well, there are some things that are absolutely required in the backcountry, and toilet paper and cocktails is one of them. So is your camera, but one lens will get, get, get you by. Well, we had a fun uh, question. What's in your cocktail? That you're oh, uh, that's a great question. <laughs> it is... Uh, rum and a product called true lemon which is all natural fruit crystals and stevia no sugar so and of course we're packing a water filter so you literally pack that ice cold mountain water put a little rum in there put a little bit of that uh, true lemon in there shake it up and you got yourself a brilliant mountain cocktail uh i think on this trip i was packing orange mango was the flavor that's the official randall hodges uh drink on the trip that is correct. You got it. All right. On to the next slide here. Now we're in the magic forest. I love this mix of yellows, reds, and greens and uh, trying to control everything in the camera. So it really comes out as I'm seeing it here. F20, eight tenths of a second, one stop dark ISO 100 in that standard roll of film and white balance 5900K with that polarizer. Uh, even though I'm not in the sun, a polarizer is critical. Uh, overcast day, rainy day, in the shade, anytime it's the middle of the day, I have a circular polarizer on. And you've used F20 on a couple of your shots. Are you not concerned with losing sharpness due to refraction? I will just ask, do you see that I've lost any, does anybody see that I've lost sharpness here? Uh, I get that question a lot because the sweet spot in your lens might be F8, F11, F13 but that's the sweet spot in the center of the lens. That's not front to back. Now, technically, if you're a pixel peeper and you zoom in you know, way too much on a photo to where you're looking at pixels and you go to the corners of my photo, you might see a little fall apart. But this image would easily print as a 44 by 78 and no customer would notice any lack of sharpness whatsoever. So just always consider the sweet spot in the lens or depth of field. What are you really trying to convey? And I really want that tree in the foreground to be sharp and the trees all the way through the photo to be sharp. And the only way to do that is with a small aperture without focal blending. So do you ever stitch exposures to widen the field when you don't have a wide angle lens? Uh, I have done that a couple of times in my career. Uh, Not really your thing. Not really my thing. Um, there have been a couple of views where I was caught without the right lens and I knew I would never be there again and I've done it, but that's just not something you're gonna find in my gallery. As a matter of fact, we sell a lot of panoramics and they are a crop, which means I've cut the top and bottom off to make them in a panoramic from one image. Right. And shooting a 50 megapixel camera and resin those images up, it's, it's not hard to get those 70 inches across either. And you know what? Stitching them together is nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that either. Like I say, if that's, you got to do it your way. Otherwise, why do it? And here's just a little vertical of the same scene, isolating that, uh, that excellent snag in the background. And this is a good study in sharpness. For those who are wondering if it's working, if you see the very bottom left corner of the tiny uh, golden larch there, you can see that's very sharp. And you can see that the snag in the background is also very sharp. And again, that would be very sharp all the way up to those ginormous prints. We've had a couple of people ask, um, do you just know what K to use or do you take a few shots with different K to see what's correct? 
I would say if you're a new photographer, you're going to have to take more than a couple shots. Uh, I, I, like I said, I'd, I'd take five. I would spread all the way across that until you see the one that's closest. Uh, you know, again, if we do the 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, you're like 6,000 is the closest. Then go a little lower, 57, go a little higher, 63, and, and, and work your way to that perfect white balance. Yeah. Pretty much now I can walk up to a scene and I already know all my settings before I get out my camera, but sometimes I'm shocked. I set it all up, set the white balance. Okay, this is going to be 5,600. I take a shot. Whoa, that looks terrible. Yeah. I was way off, but anymore, you know, I've been doing this all in camera my whole career. Uh, it's rare. And I will say white balance for a film guy, an old film guy like me is such a bonus because in film, you didn't have a white balance. You could not correct if you're in shade light or in overcast light. You could change rolls of film, but they didn't have white balance. So you were stuck with what you had. And this shot here, was it light shade or cloudy? It was, it was all in, in shade, okay. all of these shots. Uh, if it was cloudy, you would notice that white balance down around 4,800 K because cloudy is much warmer light. Um, but we were behind a really big cliff, so it, it gave us a good three hours. We shot it right until the sun came into the forest, and then we were starving and had to go back and get breakfast finally. One more from that enchanted forest. Uh, same scene, horizontal shot, same technique. Uh, I, I put these together just because a uh, little pro tip out there. Magazine color covers love vertical shots. Calendar covers love horizontal so shots. So if you've got a a good shot, you, you might want to try to take both orientations. And we'll just move right on to the next slide here. So are you a tripod guy or not a tripod guy? Every single shot you see, every single shot you'll see in both my galleries is on a tripod. There is no way to handhold these long exposures. And what so, tripod and what head do you use an L bracket? I don't use an L bracket. It, it adds a little bit of weight and I find it cumbersome. I can't change a battery with an L bracket on. There's just some things. Um, I use a, a Gitsu a Traveler tripod and a Gitsu Traveler ball head. My tripod and ball head come in at 2.9 pounds. Um, they're a bit expensive. That combo's around $1,150. Really these days, Monfrodo, lots of brands out there. You can get really close to that weight and design, maybe around 150 to 250 uh, in a carbon fiber tripod. I prefer ball head myself, but some people still like handle ones. Uh, but I think a tripod is just as important, just as critical as the camera itself. As a matter of fact, 28 years ago, something I was hiking in Montana, and I came across this guy in the bush and he, I think he was photographing, if I remember, he's photographing some woodpeckers in a tree. He had a really long lens and his camera's on a tripod. And I sneak up to him, what, what are you photographing? He goes, oh, there's some woodpeckers way out there. I'm like, wow, that's a great lens because they were way out there to me. And I'm like, hey, I want to be a professional photographer. What advice will you give me? And he looked around my pack and he goes, I see your camera hanging there, but I don't see a tripod. I said, oh, I'm a hiker. I don't need a tripod. And he goes, well, there's the river. Throw your camera in it and quit photography right now. Oh, boy. Because if you don't want to pack a tripod, you can never be a professional photographer. And that stuck. I had to learn to start packing a tripod. <laughs> well, I, worth the wait. I call this uh, larch snow in the roots. Um, all the larch needles are falling onto the trail. And it is a a magical type of snow you can only see for about a week a year. And I love all the different color components mixed into this little photo here. We'll bump right onto our next slide here. Oh yes, if you're in the enchantments, uh, mountain goats may be your friends, maybe even a little closer friendship than you might want at times, but this is their domain. And there are a lot of mountain goats in the enchantments. And I had a couple of them hanging around my camp every uh, about midday when I happened to be back in camp. The goats would come and give us a visit and makes for great photography. Now completely different than landscape photography though. Uh, Aperture priority F4. I'm not looking to get any background and focus here. I really want the uh, goat to stand out. And you can see that blurring effect behind him there. ISO, uh, excuse me, it was at one four hundredth of a second, two thirds of a stop dark, ISO 100, 
that standard roll of film still got those golden trees back there. White balance 5400K and of course a light bright warming polarizer on because it's the middle of the day. Do you use a cable release? I sure do. Every shot. Yep. Um, even though there was a cable release hanging from my camera during this shot, I was shooting so fast, I, I was reaching up and just clicking the shutter with my finger uh, because I was really trying to time my, my shutter. And then we have two questions about the LB warming polarizer and the color combo polarizer. Um, one, can you explain the difference? And number two, do you just use the lighter, brighter filter in the fall or is it good for other seasons? Oh, great questions. Um, for me, the combo, the color combo is not a good fit. Uh, it, it does change the color of the photograph, which I'm not really into doing. Um, I, I did test it and I think it's probably set up uh, to be mostly used with waterfalls. It also has a density component to it, which means it's going to lengthen the exposure. Um, so you can get a longer drag in your water. But for me, it gave a little bit of a blue tint overall to my images, so it wasn't for me. Um, just a straight polarizer can give a blue tint to the images. Uh, and if you ever hold a polarizer up to the light and just look through it, you can see it's a bluish filter. So by adding the component of the warming polarizer, it offsets that blue tint that a polarizer has. I believe it just gives a truer color to the photo and it solves that little bit of blue tint that a polarizer, regular polarizer might have. But you can also pretty much correct that just by warming up your white balance a little bit. So those who don't have a warming polarizer, you can just, you know, if I'm shooting at 6200K, you're standing next to me, maybe you're shooting at 6500K. Just warm it up a little bit, take some of that blue tone off. But Well, and you I, touched on it on our last webinar. Some people like warmer photos, that would be me. Some people like cooler photos. And so some of that is just what you're going to prefer and what kind of photo you're trying to get. Absolutely. There's no right or wrong to that. Um, you know, with my students, we could all be set up. We're all on different cameras. They all have different sensors for one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Nikons tend to run 500 to 800 points hotter than the Canon standing right wow. next to them. Wow. So if I'm shooting at 5200, my really good Nikon shooters are telling me, oh, I'm at 6200 or I'm at 6000. And that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. uh, looks good in their camera. Again, there's no right or wrong way. If you happen to like your photos a little on the cold side, Okay, great. If you like them a little on the hot side, you just really like to cook up those colors, that's great too. If you're in my class, I'm going to tell you, you pushed it too far though. I'll come over and go, ah, that's too hot. That's a little whack. Let's bring that down a little. Or that's too cold. Your, your white clouds are blue. Let's warm that up so we have white clouds. All right. One more photo of a goat here. Just giving me a nice pose. And now we'll move on to our next slide. Ah, this is uh, our second night and we're out scouting. So we've climbed the ridge. Um, if you look, you won't see it with your naked eye, but right where the light touches the back corner of that lake is where my tent is. That's my campsite. It's pretty glorious. You can't get a better camp than that. Uh, and this is Inspiration Lake and oh yeah, it's inspiring for sure. But we knew we wanted to shoot a sunset from up above looking over Perfection Lake uh, and this beautiful lake here. So we went and scouted around. We found a really nice location in, and did that during the day. That way we wouldn't be wasting time uh, in the evening looking for the location. Uh, this is shot at Aperture Priority F20, 1 13th of a second, one and a third stop dark, ISO 100. That, now I'm back to that landscape color palette because I've got some blue sky and some other colors I want to make sure I'm picking up. White balance 5400K. And in this one, I've got a four stop hard with a one stop hard. They're running at an angle right at that light line and they're slightly offset. And that's why you can't really see the filter in the photo. How did you get to that number, the four plus one stops? How did you decide? Well, when I rolled up, I knew it was going to take a lot um, because, boy, you're in shadow and you're in direct sunlight. So I started with the four stop and the sky was still too bright and the foreground was still too dark. So you just keep adding filters until you feel like they're balanced. 
So again, just kind of like white balance, it takes a little practice, but pretty soon you'll walk into a scene. You know, when I walked up, I'm like, this is probably a five stop or a six stop, but it turned out being five stops. So when you're shooting, do you, do you automatically know what to set it at or do you kind of shoot a couple of different ways and see what comes out? Oh, most of the time I know what I want to do. Uh, but for my students, they have to work their way to the photo or the ones that are standing close enough to me will just do what I'm doing, which will get them <laughs> pretty darn close um, and then but with their cameras of course if they're Nikon or Sony or Panasonic there's going to be some different adjustments but still shooting in a very similar style for an all-in camera shooter. And do you set the exposure at the sky or the foreground? Well we're in evaluated metering so the camera is looking at the entire picture. Gotcha. So you just take that first photo. First you have to balance light though. Um, and there is, I should back up a step here and just kind of go through what I teach my students as the proper steps of taking the photo. Mm -hmm. the, first, the first step is composition. Set the composition. The second step is set the filter, whether it's the split neutral density filter or the polarizer, set that. The third step is to focus. And the reason you have to focus after setting the filter, because the act of touching the camera lens or adjusting the filter could move you slightly out of focus. So always focus last. And then a lot of people don't know on a DSLR, light enters the back of the camera, the eyepiece, just like it enters the front of the camera. So either have your eye in the eyepiece or reach your hand up and shade the back of the camera. So no light can enter there. And then take your first exposure and then look at the exposure. Now, the first thing we have to get right is with a split neutral density filter is we have to balance the light. We can't decide anything else till we balance the light. Once the light's balanced, then we have to decide the exposure. We can't decide on the color or the white balance until the exposure is correct because a darker photo adds more color, a brighter photo washes out color. So we need to have the, the right exposure. Once we've got the right exposure, then we can adjust that, what I call roll of film, that color palette and that white balance and fine tune that photo. So in all, that might take you four or five or six shots to shoot, okay, make an adjustment, shoot, make an adjustment, okay, shoot, okay, now I'm balanced, now I've got the exposure, now just the white balance, boom, put it in the bank, there you go. So on this picture specifically, was the line on the filter right on the dark line in the back of the lake? Yep, exactly. And, and how and do you decide where that line goes? What do you, what do you look for? It, you look for the change in light. Okay. So uh, you can obviously see the sun line there. So we need to dip that filter just into the sun line. Uh, even though it's a hard graduated filter I use, it's still graduated. So we have to make sure and push that graduated part into the shade just a little bit. You want to look for lines that occur naturally in the photograph. Oh, if you, if you get lucky, that's what we hope for. <laughs> All right, let's move on to see what happened to this guy for sunset. So there you go, right into sunset there. Uh, aperture priority F20. Now we're all the way up to a four second exposure, one stop dark, ISO 100, that landscape roll of film, white balance 6200K. And I'm still rocking that four and one stop split neutral density filter, but I believe the very next shot, the light had balanced enough. I took out the one stop and then as it got darker, I went to a three stop. And that's a typical, at the end of the night, you start needing less filter as you go. And we'll bump up to the next slide here. Oh, that was uh, what was right behind us, basically. We were looking only in one direction. This is looking towards the upper enchantments and that little nub there on the left, well, it's much bigger than a nub. If you try to climb that, you'll feel it. Uh, that's called Little Annapurna. And if you are ever in the enchantments, you should, during the day, take a side trip up to the top of Little, little Annapurna for a mind boggling view that uh, you'll never forget. Uh, aperture priority F20, five second exposure, one stop dark. Even though I had taken some filters off looking with the sun, switching back to shooting into the sun, you got to put those filters back on because now you have more contrast. And again, I've got that four and one stop offset. That way I can blend the filter out of the photo. I call that finessing the filters. Just takes a little practice. And we'll bump up to the next slide here. This is the next day we're out scouting again. 
and we've made it all the way to the end, which is called Asgard Pass, and we backtrack just a little bit. Uh, we are probably about three miles from our camp at this point in the upper enchantments, and we're up right around 8,000 feet in elevation, which is pretty high for Washington. This is one of Washington's highest alpine areas. Got that one lone golden larch there in the foreground, and this is just a, a morning light day. It's got that a circular polarizer on it and a one-stop split neutral density filter, which I am hand-holding over the polarizer, and I'm bringing that right down to the water line because that granite is super bright, and we just need to darken it a little bit so we don't blow it out. And at F20, 130th of the second, ISO 200. I bumped that ISO up, which I hate to do. The higher that ISO goes, the lower quality print I'm going to be able to make. But we had some wind on this day, and I really wanted to keep those grasses and that golden larch as sharp as I could. Uh, so 130 for the second, white balance 5600K, and again, that polarizer and the one-stop filter. So two questions about focus. Do you back button focus, and do you use autofocus? I do not use autofocus, and I do not use back button focus. Uh, I am manually focusing it with my eye. And uh, in this one, I did turn on my live view and I used the zoom tool, the zoom button to zoom in a couple of times. And I am focusing not on the first rock there in the foreground, but the second rock right in the right. foreground. Great question, guys. Yes, and now we're making our way back towards camp. We're at the lower part of the upper enchantments. One of my favorite views, whether it's in the summer and all those trees are green or not, this really shows the upper enchantments, which is nothing but a series of rock, ice, and snow, and a bunch of little streams and ponds and tarns and lakes that all connect together. It is some of the most beautiful area you'll ever hike in your life for sure. And we were just awestruck with this morning light right, right there. We had to stop and shoot it. Aperture, and this would, by the way, would have made an excellent spot for sunset too. We just couldn't be everywhere at once. Aperture priority F20, 1 25th of a second, one stop dark, ISO 100 in that landscape roll of film, white balance 5600K. I am rocking that polarizer and a two stop split neutral density, just trying to get that balance between having enough blue in the sky, not too bright of a foreground. And I think this one worked out pretty magical and it's just, totally as peaking of fall color as it could possibly be. Now we'll, we'll shock the color palette a little bit here because the next thing, just like I have all those color palettes set up in my camera, I also have a black and white roll set up in my camera for high contrast black and white. And there's the next shot, which is a black and white right in the camera. Um, some guys will ask, why do you bother to shoot, you know, in monochrome in the camera? You can just desaturate or click the black and white button in Photoshop. That is true. You could. But your eye is out there looking at the photo on the spot. And even though this photo is a, a direct mirror of my color photo, often I change my composition in a black and white photo and I make other adjustments. So I believe it's better to shoot your black and whites out in the field. You, you use your compositional artistic eye while you're shooting it, and you'll, I think you'll have better results. And on to our next slide here. Uh, now we're down uh, above Perfection Lake, right above our camp with a little spot that we scouted for sunrise. For me, unfortunately, the sunrise didn't work out too good. Um, but I pop back up here in the afternoons for some really nice afternoon light just to kind of show the area uh, that we're in. And you can see Prisic Peak back there in the background. Uh, F20 on this one again, 180th of the second, one stop dark, ISO 400. Again, I had some wind happening. So I did have to raise that ISO to freeze those needles from blowing all around. White balance 5600K, light bright warming polarizer, and that two stop split neutral density filter. And we'll just bump ahead again here. Ah, back up to the spot, Gnome Tarn and Prisic Peak. And a beautiful afternoon light. Oh my gosh, what a glorious afternoon to be up there. I thought about putting a shot one with a gal in a red dress standing out on the rock on the right, they had to get their selfie. Uh, 
Meanwhile, all the other photographers are like, okay, hurry up, get that shot, get out of the picture. Um, but it worked out, got this shot. And uh, sometimes you don't need a huge sunrise or sunset to have a dramatic photo. Sometimes just some good morning or evening side light is going to do the trick just right. Aperture priority F20, 1 50th of a second, one and a third stops dark, ISO 100, landscape roll of film, white balance 5600K. And I'm hand holding a three stop graduated split neutral density filter. Oh no, I'm sorry. I'd already pulled the polarizer off in this one and just have a three stop filter. The shots right before it still was good for a polarizer. And that's a good time for me to explain. About an hour before sunset, you wanna take the polarizer off the camera if you have sky involved. Uh, a polarizer will start to affect your photo negatively you'll start to get a kind of blue ball in the center of your picture. If you ever see that, and it can show up even, in, even more on a wide angle lens. If you ever see that, it's telling you it's time to take off the polarizer, put your split neutral density filter holder on and just go with splits. In the same reference, I wouldn't put on a polarizer till at least an hour after sunrise for the exact same situation. So um, just keep an eye on that sky. If you're not getting a nice blue all the way across your photo, it's probably not polarizer time. So just work your split neutral density filters. So why do you use hard stop filters versus soft stop? That is an outstanding question and a very important question. If you sign up for one of my classes and it's a sunrise sunset class or adventure, the hards are required. Um, softs only darken the top of the sky a little bit. It does not trick the camera into switching its shutter, which you need to. What you're trying to do is darken the sky, trick the camera to think in the sky and the water are the exact same exposure. So you get a balanced picture. With a soft, you'll never trick the camera to changing its exposure. You'll merely darken the top of the sky a little bit. And since it doesn't have a hard edge, if you ever hold up a soft filter, it blends like a whole inch and a half through that filter. There, you just won't be able to get a balance. It just doesn't work out. So uh, I don't ask you bring them to class. I don't own any and I don't use any. And on I, this shot, did you hold the ND at the water line? Exactly. Okay. That's, a, that's a perfect spot. All right. And another sunset, um, almost in the exact same location as my last shot. This is what I deemed my gallery spot would be, except this night we had a little more than alpenglow. We had uh, some nice clouds that turned pink in the sky. However, I did not pick this for the gallery shot because we also had a little wind and that lake just wasn't as crisp as the first night with the alpenglow. So this got bumped out of the gallery shot scene, but still a sight to see and a photo to shoot for sure. Uh, aperture priority F20, 2.5 second ex exposure, one stop dark, ISO 100, landscape roll of film. That white balance is all the way up to 7,700K. Uh, three stop split neutral density filter right on that lake line again. Oh, we're up the next day for sunrise on our last day. Boo-hoo. How did all the time fly back so fast? I don't know. Uh, again, if you look in the right-hand side of this picture, you see Inspiration Lake up there tucked in the corner. And that little bit of golden larch right in front of it, that's where my tent is, just to give you some perspective. And if you look above Ins Insp uh, Inspiration Lake there, you'll see the ridge line where we stood to shoot the sunset a couple nights before, just to kind of give you some sort of feel for how big this area is and what this area is about. Um, this is very close to that Gnome Tarn shot from the night before this location. So, uh, but this is, I needed a shot of Little Annapurna and I tucked myself into this foreground. Now, you'll notice I had some struggles, F20, six tenths of a second, one and two thirds stop dark, ISO 400, landscape roll of film, white balance 7200K with a three stop split on. You don't usually need as much when you got barely balanced light on the splits, but I had we had some pretty bad winds this morning and you can see in the left part of my photo, yep, there's some blurry stuff there. So as an all in camera shooter, I can't take one shot at ISO 1000, freeze all that, take another shot for the sky, composite them together, blend them together. 
So it was true to form, wind was blowing, it showed up in my photo and that's just the best I could do. But I still love this view and I'll miss it. And now let's, we're gonna finish this up back at Nome Tarn at sunrise. This is a peak that gets light both in the evening and in the morning, a little direct, more direct in the evening, but you still get just enough touches on the spire up there to make this a very worthwhile morning shot. And one thing that happens in the fall is that light, as you'll see in the next photo, jets right through the little V there to the right of Prusik Peak and it hits those larch and it'll just make them glow like you can't believe. And we'll bump up to that photo. Boom, there they are, the lights are on. The light snuck through, lit up those trees. We're waiting for it, glad we got it. Aperture priority F20, one sixth of a second, one stop dark, ISO 100. That landscape roll of film, white balance 6400K and again that three stop split neutral density filter on. And I believe that is the last shot. We'll bump forward here right. for some questions and you can uh, pick up some contact info there. Uh, feel free to copy that stuff down if you want to get a hold of me. So we have a couple of questions here that I've been holding off on. Um, in the meantime, like Randall said, there are links on the screen. They'll be here in the recording as well, but there's links to his website, his uh, portfolio page on the Singray site, his Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, and if you go to his website, there are, uh, there's uh, information about classes and also gallery events. So, yes, yeah. if you wanted, if you were on my website, you could click the lessons tab to see all of my offerings from local classes up here in the Northwest to all over the West. And also on that homepage of my website, you'll see the out in the field with Randall J. Hodges video link. And if you want to kind of see me in action, I kind of do out in the field lessons that way. Um, you know, take a watch to one of those videos. I might recommend the Summit Lake video uh, and, and take a little adventure and you'll see it happening in the back of the camera. You'll see me talking through my settings. It's and really high energy and really fun to watch. Oh, we have a blast out there. And actually, when I was just in Olympic National Park over the last three days, we filmed another one. So mm -hmm. hopefully keep an eye out in the next couple of weeks, we'll be releasing that one. And boy, we had an amazing trip. You can watch me get hit by a couple of good waves and do some fun photography. But if you're looking for a little more info on how you might expect to be taught out in the field, those out in the field video series, that, that's the way to go. And let's hit up some of those questions, Michelle. Yeah. So we had uh, no less than five people ask about those color rolls of film. How do you set those up? Is it different per camera? It is a little different per camera, but I'll give you a generic recipe that should work on most of the cameras. So okay. I'm gonna give everybody a second to grab a pen there. Thought, you know, we could do a whole webinar probably just on that with the different camera brands, but. Oh, he's probably sure could, you know. Tonight. <laughs> um, so for Canon, it's called set picture style. For Nikon, it's set picture control. Uh, Panasonic has their creative styles, their creative colors. Uh, Sony, they're all, every brand, every uh, model of Sony names them a little different, but it's usually creative colors or creative styles or things. And, and for the most part, most cameras will all have the same names, standard, landscape, Nikons will add vivid to that, uh, monochrome, uh, some cameras have faithful, some have neutral. I would avoid those two. Those two are, are, are worthless. Uh, and some of the Sonys and the mirrorless cameras even get into almost an artsy color. We're not looking for those. We just want to set up the, the standard, uh, the landscape, the vivid. And here would be a basic recipe. And this is from where the camera was set, not from zero, because they're all set to something out of the camera. You would turn your sharpness up by one. You would turn your contrast up by two. You would turn your saturation by up by either three or four. And to start with, you would leave your color tone alone. And then you'd go out and, sh and, and I would shed up, set up your, your standard, your landscape and your vivid all exactly identical. They actually come out of the camera different. So by setting them up identical to start with at least, you can compare them and see how they're pushing the color differently in your camera. And then in each one of those 
what we'll call rolls of film, you'll want to do that white balance experiment, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 K, and see how white balance is, is changing, warming up and cooling off that color palette. Right. So it's pretty rudimentary. It's so much easier to show you in a class. It's really hard to just say, you know, in a webinar, oh, just go do this because not too many Something people. Something are... that resonated on the last webinar, you said, if your iPhone seems to be getting better color than your fancy schmancy new camera, then these are settings that need to be messed with. That's right. You're, no matter what phone you have, it came out of the box set up with a full color palette ready to shoot. No digital camera, whether it's mirrorless or DSLR, came out of the box with its color palette ready to shoot. Like I said, most cameras are pushing between five and 10% of their uh, capability. So just imagine that you've been shooting your camera and it's missing 90% of its color. Yeah. And that just changes everything if you really want to try to do this in camera. Now, if you're a post-processor, you probably don't want to set up those color palettes because there's some extra steps you need to take in order to actually capture them. And I need to give you that warning now, otherwise I'll have some, some mad peeps out there. Mm -hmm. So there's two parts to a raw file. There's the base bottom of the raw file, Photoshop, Lightroom, any kind of uh, post-processing software is going to open that bottom piece. And then there's the camera's proprietary software. That's where those color palettes sit. So if you're gonna do this in RAW, and I do shoot in RAW, a lot of people mistakenly think I shoot in JPEG. Um, if you're gonna do it in RAW, when you're done shooting the photo, you have to open that RAW file in the software that came with your camera. And all cameras come with their own software. Nikon has Nix, for Canon it's DPP4, Sony has their software and so on. Just simply open the raw file in that software. You'll see it just as you shot it in the camera and do a file convert save as and save it to another file type. Really doesn't matter, but I recommend a TIFF. A TIFF is the print file. That's the big boy file. That's where the big, big prints are gonna come from. Then if you want to go make your adjustments to your photo, take that TIFF file into Lightroom, Photoshop, or some other program and adjust it because at least you've captured your in-camera work. Uh, the way I can really drive that home is I showed you an in-camera black and white. Had I opened that raw file in, in Photoshop, it would have been in color. It has no idea, Photoshop has no idea that I shot a black and white. That's that proprietary part of that raw file. So that's why we have to use that. Now there are some plugins for Lightroom that you can get uh, and even for Photoshop that some of the cameras will import those settings along with the raw file so you're capturing everything in camera. But the only way you're gonna know that uh, is if you dig in and try to figure that out. But if you've ever thought you took a better photo in the back of your camera and then you open it in Photoshop and went, why is that so drab? Mm -hmm. Photoshop literally scraped the top off your photo and you didn't know it. We had someone else echoing that saying, glad he's mentioning this. Go to your OEM software before Adobe. Um, and he, his workflow is actually TIFF, but he said, bake your in-camera work using the OEM software. Save there you software. go. That's it exactly. Great answer. All right. So uh, let's start at the top. Randall, do you prefer cameras that have the anti-aliasing filter removed for sharper images? I sure do. Yeah, I shoot a Canon 5D SR for filter removed. Okay. So yeah, yeah, for a landscape photographer, yes. If you're a portrait photographer and you're going to shoot a lot of patterns and a lot of clothes, nope, you probably need that filter. But if you're a landscape guy, you don't want the filter. Where do you set your exposure? Like without filters on, set exposure on foreground, lock exposure, then select and add filter? Uh, no, you should always balance the light first. But again, we want to use uh, evaluated metering. And so then you're going to take your first shot and decide if your photo's too light or too dark. So we don't need to pick a place to set the exposure because we can see the photo. So just take your first picture and discover if it's too light or too dark. If your sky is too bright and your foreground's too dark, well, you haven't balanced the light in the camera yet, so you're gonna have a really hard time getting a true exposure. And what do you do if you're using a mirrorless re-live view? 
Oh, just use your live view. It's okay. Um, I prefer not in a DSLR, but if, if you're live view all the time, then just learn to use that live view because that's what you got. And what is the difference between white balance and Kelvin? They're one in the same. So white balance uh, for people who only have symbols in their camera, sunny, cloudy, shady, we would call that white balance. But those of us who have a little more expensive camera, if you keep moving across that menu, you'll find K for Calvin. And that just means that you can set the temperature by number rather than by symbol. So they are one in the balance. same. White balance is a thing and Kelvin is the measurement. There you go. We'll go with that. <laughs> and why use hard grads? Not very many folks agree with this because the hard edge uh, dark on objects near. Well, I'll just ask, did you see my filter line in any of those photos? Uh, because if you use a soft edge, you will not trick the camera into changing its shutter speed. You will not get a balanced exposure. Uh, it just doesn't, they just, like I said, it, well, let's, let's say you're a post-processor and you're not trying to balance your exposure because you're going to take multiple exposures and use those in post-processing. That would be a good time to use a soft filter because you just want to darken the sky enough that it doesn't get blown out and then take your three exposures, the bright one, the middle one, the dark one, or seven or 20, however many you wanna do. That's, that would be the application for a soft filter. But for an in-camera shooter, we're not layering images together. We need to trick the camera on the spot. And the only way to do that is with a hard edge filter. And how do you calculate the minutes on a long exposure, like 50 minutes, how do you get there? <laughs> well, that, I love that question. Uh, but it's a question that you really need to go out and, and do a lot of practice to figure out. Now, I kind of have a rudimentary uh, way of doing it. If I'm standing in the dark and my buddy is six feet away from me and I can see his face, there's some ambient light out there, 20, 30 minutes max. That's it. If I can barely see his face, oh, it's kind of dark, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, that's going to work fine. If I can't see him at all, I can leave the camera open as long as I want. But I might have wanted to check when the moon was going to pop up because you certainly don't want that popping up in the middle of a one hour and a half exposure and ruining all your hard work. But it's really the, the true answer to that. It's guesswork. It's just experience and guesswork and, and trying to figure out, you know, where the moon's going to be, when's it going to be, when am I looking away from city light or... You just have to be able to judge light at night. And the only way to do it with those long exposures is a little bit of practice. Right. And how do you calculate how many stops of filter you need to use with changing light? You just keep analyzing the top of the photo to the bottom of the photo. As soon as the bottom of the photo looks brighter than the top, you've got too much filter on. If the top of the photo looks brighter than the bottom, you don't have enough filter on. So just remember to look at the top, look at the bottom. Are they balanced? Is my foreground still too dark? Or is my foreground too poppy? And make that adjustment. It just takes practice. Um, but with a digital camera, being able to see the back of the camera, what an advantage. It shouldn't take you too long to figure it out. And then do you have any problems with the lighter, brighter color polarizer um, and X? Like combining it with things? I do not combine those filters. I only shoot the light, bright warming polarizer. And since I have an ultra thin one, it doesn't have threads on the end of it. I couldn't screw another filter over the top of that if I wanted, but I, I just would never screw two filters on the camera. Um, if and I'm using the holder, but would a Coke and P holder work for ND filters? Uh, the P holder is really small. It's not what I recommend. I recommend the Z series size. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said, during the day, if my polarizer is on, I'm just going to handhold the filter over it. I'm not going to, because once you screw a, a, a filter holder on your polarizer, now you can't use your polarizer. And there are some filter holders that have what we call drop-in polarizers. So you have both together. But those are a real pain for me. I don't care for them. My students struggle with them in class. I just keep the two separate. During the day, the exposures are quite short. I can easily hold a hand hold a filter right up to the glass. I just, you want to touch it right to that polarizer and seal it and just hold still for a breath, take your shot. 
But at sunrise and sunsets, when the exposures get long, you're not gonna have a polarizer on anyway. So you're gonna have your split neutral density filter holder on. Right. And then your depth of field at 24 millimeters, um, do you use an app to calculate that? Uh, no. Uh, I don't know why we would need to use an app for that, but there is an app for everything. Um, like I said, I just set to a small aperture, F18, F20, F22, and I focus in the foreground. That's going to create a big depth of field. Unless for some reason, I don't want a big depth of field, like the goat that you can see on the screen there. My mountains in the background are certainly blurred way out. And that, that was by design. I wanted them blurred out. I didn't want your eye going past the goat. I wanted you to look right at the goat. So we wanna, we wanna choose our depth of field. Um, sometimes, let's say we're shooting, a, a great example is shooting a stand of white bark aspens out in a field of fall color. I want the eye to go right to the white bark. So instead of shooting F22 and including all that foreground, I'm gonna shoot maybe F8 and I'm gonna focus on the aspens. That's gonna leave my foreground a little soft in the, in the foreground and soft in the background, really gonna isolate the uh, aspens in the center. Or maybe we're shooting a big field of tulips and yeah, I shoot that at F22, get all those tulips as many as I can and focus in a big sunset behind. But what if I'm shooting a field of yellow tulips and there's one red one 30 or 40 feet out there? I might drop down to F5.6, focus right on the red one. So it's blurry going to it. Then that red tulip's super sharp and it's blurry going out of it. That's, that's an artistic decision. So learning about how to control depth of field and use it as part of a compositional tool is really important. I'm sorry. How many days were you on this trip? How many batteries did you carry for multi-day shooting? And did you use any type of battery charger hooked up to like solar? Well, like that? that's a great question for backpacking. And it, it's one, I have not brought the extra battery charger either for the cell phone or for um, the camera. Uh, my 5DSR is a battery hog. So this was a four day trip, three nights and I brought six batteries and I burned up five of them. Oh. Um, and, and I will just add, the star photo took up almost one entire battery. Oh, wow. So that's not something I could go on a trip and do a, a one hour exposure every night. I just don't have the battery power for it. Um, and then some cameras, like maybe Olympus or Panasonic, they have built-in neutral density filters. Do you think those are better than not having filters? I'm not sure how they really work, but in the future, do you think technology will give us perfect lines outlining mountains, like more perfect than the line in the filter? You know, I've often <laughs> dreamed, I've often <laughs> dreamed of designing this somehow. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's not even that. May maybe it's a pen that you just literally darken the top of your, your lens with that goes away. Or maybe, uh, uh, you know, it seems like there'd be a way. I've never seen the in-camera in filters work to, to the degree that a Singray filter will work. Mm -hmm. I, I think they are helpful. But I think for the most part, people who are trying to employ them, um, probably just end up shooting more than one exposure and, and doing some post-processing. Well, and the Mountain V filter that Singray developed with you, that was actually your idea and Singray developed it. Um, but that's one example of a custom-made filter for a custom use where you wouldn't necessarily need to stack two filters to get that V. Well, yeah. And, and that is, I developed that specifically because when I climb high in the mountains, and I look over a river valley, that river valley is always cutting through a mountain range and it makes a natural V. Or at the back of a lake, it's almost always a natural V. But pushing a hard stop right in that situation often will darken the sides of the mountain where I don't want them dark. So for me, when I'm backpacking in the, in the summer, those, those filters are critical for me. Um, right. I, I would say if you find you're out and like two or three times, you're like, gosh, if I just had that Mountain V filter, well, then that's a good buy for you. And that's really who I designed it for besides myself. 
Um, and that technology catches up, if you have an idea for something you're shooting all the time and it needs to be this funky line for your photos to come out, um, call Singray and they will make you a filter. So That's right. Yep. I'm always popping up <laughs> ideas and sharing them with Singray in case they can help me achieve something I'm looking for out in the The field. guys in the workshop are probably rolling their eyes like, yeah, no big deal. It's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, curse that Mountain V filter. <laughs> uh, next question. I'm still confused about your workflow to set the exposure. If you use it matrix metering and then the meter sets for the bright sky, then the foreground is dark. How do you know what ND to use? Ah, well, that's the problem. You're relying on the camera meter and not your eye. Um, remember, I'm not looking at histogram and I'm not looking at at anything but the back of the camera. So if you can already see with your eye, the sky is too bright, put an ND filter on first and then worry about the exposure. So you, you're trying to decide between the sky and the ground before you've actually balanced the light. And that's why people do brackets, you know, pop, 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 a bright photo, a medium photo, a dark photo. Somewhere in there, they've got all of it. But if you're trying to take one shot, you simply can't decide where to meter until you balance the light with, with a split neutral density filter. Then the exposure will be much easier to handle. So um, I think that's getting the cart ahead of the horse by trying to pick the exposure before you even have balanced the light with the filter. It'll, it'll become much more apparent if you stick the filter in first. And you don't know, just put the three stop in. That'll be always the safest guess. Put a three-stop filter in, you'll see the sky darken, you'll see the foreground brighten, and now the camera has a much easier time of picking a, an exposure. The next question from Gary, do you think L lenses can handle 60 MP, 80 MP, 100 MP before upgrading lenses to handle high megapixel cameras? What is higher than an L series lens? That's my question. <laughs> uh, to me, that's the... Uh, well, okay, I'm a Canon guy and I do not get paid by Canon. So it's just from an in-camera shooter standpoint. And it's just from me, you know, I teach 250 to 300 students a year. I get every single camera in my class. If it's a new camera, it comes to class. I try to master it right away and figure it out. Canon has the, the best sensor tone. And in my opinion, they also make the best lenses for their cameras. I, I always recommend whatever brand you have, try to stick with the brand name if possible. Tamron and Sigma make good lenses too, so I, I'm not kicking them to the curb, but those lenses that are designed for those bodies are the best of the best in my opinion. Um, you know, it used to be if we go back 25 years ago, maybe we packed a whole bunch of primes because we needed sharp images. So maybe we had to carry around a 16, a 24, a 35, a 50, an 80, and so on. Zoom lenses are so good now, we just don't have to do that. Uh, my opinion is just don't stretch a zoom too far. A 24 to 105 is great. A 24 to 300 wouldn't be very good lens. Right. And then do you do one-on-one -on -one, uh, QA and what do you charge for that? I do. Uh, I'd call that a private lesson. It lasts for a, a, an hour and a half and it costs a hundred dollars. I do them in person in my gallery. If I can't get a student into a class, I'll pick a slow time. You can come on down for an hour, hour and a half. We'll go through some camera setup. We'll go through that. But I do the exact same thing over the phone. Um, no problem at all. And it, I do it quite often for people who can't make it out to a class to just try to talk them into some in-camera photography. And there's some links on the screen for Randall's website where you can go to learn more. Um, how did you learn about this location? And how many nights did you spend in camp? Uh, three nights in camp, four days. I've always known about this location. If you're a backpacker, probably definitely in the Northwest, you know of the enchantments. It is probably one of the Everests of the backpacking and hiking community is to see the enchantments. It's as good as it gets anywhere in the world. Um, you know, this would be like going to see the Matterhorn in Switzerland or the Maroon Bells in Colorado. Um, it's just as good as it gets. The only difference with this location is it takes a lot of physical strength to get there. 
This isn't for a beginner hiker whatsoever. If, if you haven't hiked enough, you don't understand how much elevation gain 6,000 feet is, but it's hours and hours of climbing. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of elevation and a lot of mileage. So it, it's, and most people would say the enchantments is as tough as hiking gets anywhere. It can't, mm -hmm. it cannot get tougher. Uh, and, you know, believe me, when I woke up on day two in the morning and rolled over to get out of my tent for sunrise, I'm like, oh, man, I felt every muscle in my body, all the pack rubbings that had happened the day before. But mm -hmm. I, I, I experienced all that with a smile on my face because I already had that gallery shot in the bank. Nice. Um, Rose wants to know when your tripod stayed in salt water, did you disassemble all the sections and clean the salt water and sand? That is a very good question. No, I am not super adept of getting my tripod back together, and it's so expensive that uh, when you take those shoes out, it's easy to damage those shoes. It it's hard to get them back in sometimes. If your tripod comes out relatively easy, great. I do extend the tripod all the way out and I give it a bath uh, after I've been on the beach. Um, same thing with the filters though. After a trip to the beach because of what I call the icky sticky gets on everything. Mm -hmm. I, w I wipe down my camera. I use the Ray View uh, Singray filter cleaner on all my filters. I just kind of reset everything, brush all the sand out of my bag, you know. And I have a special pair of boots called beach boots. These are boots that have already been worn out in the mountains, but I'll still hike them on the beach because if they get salt water on them, I'm okay with that. They're already worn out. Um, but yeah, salt, salt, is, uh, salt water is bad for the, the gear. You just have to, you have to take care with it. But I will say this, you bought the camera gear to use it. The beach is one of the most beautiful places to shoot. Mm -hmm. So get, it, get out there and use it. Go do it. And you gave some specifics when you were talking about the color palette, sharpness up one, saturation up two. What was the third setting? Oh, it was sharpness up one, contrast up two, ah. and saturation up either three or four or to the maximum. Okay. Uh, but if you're a person that doesn't like quite so much color, go three. If you really want to see what your camera can do, go four. And then do you know if the 5D SR is about to be discontinued? There are some wicked sales on that camera body right now. Oh, man, let me tell you, I would buy one. Uh, if you can still find one, yes, it is discontinued. It is going to go out of stock. You may not even be able to get one right now as we sit here. Uh, I, I already had two of them, and B&H Photo put it on sale from $3,800 to $1,499. I, I just bought another one. <laughs> so, yeah. Good deal then. Oh, crazy good deal. Okay. Um, someone said they don't agree with your metering process and other Singray ambassadors don't do it that way, but he's intrigued with your HSI process. Okay. I, I have one question. For, and, and who am I talking to? Anonymous attendee. Anonymous attendee. <laughs> I would like to know his metering process. Everyone's got their own. Okay, that's what he said. Everybody's got their own. <laughs> yeah. So, again, if you do any post-processing at all, you should be concerned at what you're metering and how you're metering. If, if you're trying not to just take a bracket, that would be important to you. But I'm an all-in camera shooter, and it doesn't matter where my camera meters because I'm going to look at the photo and decide if my camera's, if the photo is too light or too dark. Right. There's no, no reason to get into a big... Uh, issue with what what's metering where it's metering or what because i can just sim you know in film days i used to spot meter a lot i would pick the spot i wanted the camera to meter somewhere in the mid tones but in in a digital camera where i can see the back of the screen i simply don't have to let the camera look at the whole picture and do its best and um as, like i said as soon as i balance those metering from top to bottom with my split neutral density filter i'm gonna nail it um, and, and I would just say, if, if you look through all the pictures we just showed in this webinar, if you saw a problem with the metering in any of them, then I suppose I'm not doing the metering right. But if you thought my exposures were pretty right on, then my method's pretty solid. 
Right. And I can say from doing, we've been doing these webinars for gosh, three years now, everyone has their own technique and what works for one person may not be the, the number one technique for another. So I appreciate all of the different ways and I love coming to these webinars and, and learning from everyone how they do it. I will just say this, there's no right or wrong way, just your way. There's and if my, if, the, if my way, it right. Yeah, if my way doesn't work for you, hey, I'm not offended. My way definitely works well for me and it makes me happy, which is the most important piece. Right. John wants to know, I generally pull the card from the camera and save the CR2 to my computer file via computer card reader, then open it. Is this where I should open it with the Canon software? I shoot a Canon EOS 5D Mark IV for landscapes. Yes. So um, I'd even go back another step. If you've downloaded the entire software suite, you have an EOS utility. Don't take the card out of your camera. Plug the camera into the computer with the, the cable that came with your camera. Turn the camera on. The EOS utility will pop up automatically and it'll say, do you want me to download these images? And you pick a destination folder for them to go in and download them. And then once they're downloaded, that will prompt your DPP, Digital Photo Professional, to come up on its own. So you could even simplify your process one step further, just plug it into the computer. Okay. And we have had at least four people ask if you do Zoom or any kind of remote training opportunities. So maybe something for the future? Um, I do, again, that would be uh, the same thing as a uh, private lesson. If you want to do a Zoom meeting with me, I will let you set up the Zoom meeting, send a link, and we will uh, schedule a time, and we can certainly do it. Um, at, this, uh, at this time, uh, this is something I will get to where I, I do classes via Zoom, but for, out in the, for my style of photography, it is just so much more effective to be out in the field. And while I'm a young enough guy to still be out there in the field doing it, that is how I prefer to teach. And not only that, there's a whole nother component besides photography. I want to put you in the right place at the right time in the right light over and over and over again. And yes, I'm going to train you to shoot like a pro right in your camera. But I'm also hoping you're going to have an experience and you're going to meet a bunch of friends that you might have for the rest of your life and you're gonna have so much fun. I will just say, I have a number of students that are into their 20th, 25th class with me. And it's not because they're not shooting at a high level. It's because they know when I put out a class, I'm gonna do all the research, show them all the places to be and make sure they're nailing it and putting it in the bank. Right. And then someone wanted to know, when you're hand holding those filters, do they scratch against the CPOI? Um, they could, but no, uh, you'd have to hit it pretty hard to the lens to actually scratch it. Where you might scratch it is if you drop it. Um, the other way you might scratch it is if you get some dirt inside the pouch you keep it in. Um, that's probably where most of the scratches come from. So you do yourself a favor to make sure you keep those pouches clean and maybe just clean them out every so often. When the Stingray filters come in those nice soft pouches so they fit easily in your bag without taking up too much extra space. That is true. Um, those pouches are very, very nice. However, I like to have all 12, I carry 12 filters. So I've got a, I've got a, a filter pack 100 on my hip. It just goes through a belt loop and I need to have them even handier. But, but you know, out on the beach, some sand gets into that filter pouch. And yep, if I'm not paying attention, I'm cram a couple filters in there. I could scratch them. Yeah. So on this trip, how many exposures did you make per day on average? Uh, you know, it's hard to I, make. I, no, I came at four day trip. I clicked the shutter 1,600 times. All right. But I only brought home 411 pictures. So a lot of those exposures were trying to get those settings dialed in, trying to get the right filter. I just delete those right away. Okay. And, and then there's always, you set up for a sunset. You're going to shoot from the beginning to the end of the sunset. And that might be a hundred clicks right there, but I'm only going to keep five or 10 of those. So you don't wait to get home and look at them on a big monitor. You can tell from looking in the viewfinder. 
Oh yeah, actually I have a feeling for which clicks were the best. I try to eliminate all shots outside of that. Uh, if you really want to help your workflow, bring home less pictures. Yeah. You'll, 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 because you know out in the field when the sweet spot was. I know when the wind did not blow. Mm -hmm. And I will immediately favorite the photo that I know the wind did not blow and just delete all the ones where I knew the wind was blowing. Wow. Um, that just makes so much easier for your workflow. The less you bring home, the higher quality you bring home. And I think it makes you a better photographer to be an in camera editor. But of course, that Hoodman loop will make that job much, much better for you. Right. And how do you eliminate noise with your long exposures? I turn on long exposure noise reduction right in the camera. <laughs> well, that's cheating. <laughs> uh, it's just the way to go. Um, one thing you don't see a lot from my collections or you don't see a lot of Milky Way shots. Um, mine is, my camera is not a high ISO camera. Right. It's not meant to be jacked up that high. And, and really good Milky Way shots that you see are generally composites. They're two photos put together. They shot the foreground in the early evening and then they waited a few hours and then they shot the Milky Way and they composite those two together. Or with star trackers or we can, boy, just star photos, you can get into some pretty intense technique, but I'm an in-camera shooter. So for me, I generally enjoy shooting a, a short star photo if there's some sort of moonlight out to light up the foreground and light up the mountain. I don't need a bazillion stars and um, I don't need to see galaxies and nebulas that your eye is not seeing in my star photo. So um, for me, the long exposure is just fun. Um, and you never know what's going to happen during a long exposure. So. Okay. And then on lenses, why the 24 to 105 over the 24 to 70 Canon lens? The most recent 24 to 70 is supposed to be better. Oh, great question. Uh, there are two major reasons. One, I see a lot in the 70 to 105 range. I shoot a lot in that range. And two, that lens weighs about twice as much as my lens. So for a backpacker, that is a very important key. And when you can only take one lens, that little bit more stretch. Um, I shoot the L series 25 to, 24 to 105 Mark II. It is a fantastic lens. And even, even technically, if that 24 to 70 rates a little, a little sharper, I would just again say, come look at any of my 40 by 60 prints and see if you could really even tell the difference. There's a point when the cameras, the dynamic range and the lenses are so good that now we're just splitting hairs trying to get that one tiny step better, which no viewing audience will ever see. Okay. And we have a technical question. I'm hoping one of the Singray staff will answer me. Uh, why do filters use 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and 0.9 instead of one, two, or four stops on the filters? I can answer that. I can answer that because they're shooting leaf filters and not sing rays. You don't have the right filters. Sing, sing rays actually say one, two, and three stop. Uh, just kidding. I'm, I'm not knocking leaves. Bring them to class. We'll do fine with them. Yeah. I like your answer, though. I'll tell you. I, I do, too. It's simpler to teach on sing rays. One, two, and three stop. A sensitive question here. Did you bring the dog? Oh, the new dog? Trip. Yeah. Uh, well, you probably saw in my last webinar, we had a little tribute to my old doggy, Shyla. Um, the new dog is still in training. She is a, a, a master handful right now. <laughs> um, but we are making progress, but I've only had her for seven days. So okay. it, it will take probably a full year or two before she's trained enough to be a gallery dog. Right. Um, right now, we're really focused on just basic obedience. And I'm working every morning on off-leash training so I can get her trail ready. Well, she'll get there. I'm sure you're motivated. Oh, yes. <laughs> she's it, she's it, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say she's an awesome doggy though. Foxy Roxy. She's gonna be an amazing hiker. Shows good potential. Um, is the color palette the same for black and white? Um, no, good question. So in black and white, you're gonna want to move your sharpness up three because they've set the sharpness really low in most cameras. And then in contrast, you're going to, I always shot high contrast black and white. So you're going to want to move that contrast up to three or four, depending on how much contrast you like. There is no saturation, 
but there is a filter effect and I highly recommend you put the red filter on. Us old school black and white film shooters always held the red filter in front of our camera lens. It allows the camera to see more depth in gray, but in a digital, you can just put that red filter on. And you could also select, um, if you wanted to change from a standard black and white, you could switch over to that warm Western sepia, which is not a look I care for, but some people do, and, and that is capable in all cameras. Do you ever shoot infrared? I do not. Okay. And then Mary wants to know, why is low pass filter better than a regular filter? Uh, low pass filter is actually a, a filter cancellation, so it'd be no filter. Um, on the smaller cameras, it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, they almost all have the filter in there. You would never even know it. But when you start getting up in a lot of megapixels, like 50 plus megapixels, that filter is a layer in between the camera and the sensor. So it, it in a sense, is dumbing down the image slightly. It won't be quite as sharp. But again, if you're shooting um, patterns like you would on people's clothing and, and modeling, Without that sensor, it does a weird thing to the sensor and it causes some weird aberration and designs to show up that that filter cancels. So, you, you know, it's just all in what you shoot. If you're landscape, you don't need the filter. And if it's in your camera, you're A-OK -okay with it. It's no big deal. Right. And do you use DPP for downloading and saving to TIFF? Yeah, uh, exactly. I use DPP to do a file, convert, save as. I go to an 8-bit TIFF because uh, that's what my printers read. Um, I could go to a 16-bit TIFF, uh, which I will do on occasion for a really big Lumachrome, if I'm gonna have something really, really big made. But for the most part, an 8-bit TIFF makes 146 megabyte file for me, and that's plenty big enough. Right. And then how much difference is there between Mark One or Mark II on the 24 to 105? I would say marginal. I mean, not marginal. I would say it is, it is noticeable. Um, I noticed instantly when I, when I got a camera that had the Mark II lens that it is a sharper, all around sharper lens. Right. So that is an upgrade I think would be worth making. And then last uh, comment, maybe question of the night. Um, doing in-camera takes guts. Try sending in-camera to Nikon, SnapBridge, Twitter. You think differently without post-processing is a crutch. Ah, I, I, I will challenge that though. <laughs> Those are all social media sites where people judge your photography. Right. I'll just say I work with some of the biggest ca ca um, ca um, calendar manufacturers in the world they would not use any of those post-process photos. Right. right. So publication and professional use is different than social media. Yeah. Um, Keep in mind your audience and where you're going. If you're going to enter a photo contest with National Geographic, then you don't want to do post-processing. But, you know, if you're being judged on Instagram and Twitter, it's, you know, it's a little bit more acceptable. And just remember on Instagram and Twitter, for the most part, you're looking at a tiny screen on a phone. You're not looking at a 40 by 60 print. Yeah. So there's, it's just, uh, again, it's whatever makes you happy. But a lot of my publishers prefer very little or no uh, post-processing. And it is one of the reasons I am one of the most published photographers in the United States. Because publishers love using my work. I have no layers. My images are not flattened. They can easily tear down the images and recreate them for CMYK printing. So uh, just keep that in mind that there are two sides to that coin. Depends on your goal, where those photos are gonna end up. That's exactly right. Mary wants to know, could the 5DSR be used for infrared? It could be. I don't know if I'd feel comfortable disabling that camera sensor to make it infrared, but if you had two bodies and you were okay to, well, I guess if it's on sale for fifteen hundred bucks, you're not altering a thirty eight hundred dollar camera, but it's not not something I would do. And I personally, again, if you're very stoked on infrared photography, then do it. I mean, do what makes you happy. I'm not that stoked on it. I like natural landscape colors, so that's that's just me. That's just where I'm I'm with it. And you mentioned the red filter when shooting black and white. Is it also sometimes called an orange filter? Nope. There is an orange filter also. 
So if your camera only has orange, go with orange, but you should find a red filter in there too. Okay, and then last question of the night, I promise. Um, don't forget the battery pack, 10,000 or 20,000 mAh, will your can will the camera handle it? I don't use a battery pack, so I am not an expert in that. I just keep adding more batteries to my bag. So okay. um, I, I don't like, like you can snap on that, that battery grip on the bottom of most cameras mm -hmm. and it makes the camera awkward to me and out of balance. Yeah. So I, I would just rather pack extra batteries and, and go with it. Yeah. Uh, I, I do, the longest backpack I can do is six days. So that's all the battery I need to cap. And when I do a six day, I'm probably packing eight batteries. I'm, I'm taking it easy on the long exposure star photo. Well, and being an all in camera shooter, you are way into the, the tangible controls and the, the feel of the camera. And so that's something that would matter to you. Oh, absolutely. Yep. That extra weight or just having the extra bulk. Yep. So. It's also one of the reasons I personally don't like the little bitty mirrorless cameras. You put a big boy lens on those and they feel out of balance to me. Yeah. So. Yeah, you're a hands-on kind of guy. All right, that's it for our questions. So uh, anyone has any questions about Randall J. Hodges, you can check out the Singray website. You can check out Randall's website. He has workshops coming up and he has gallery events coming up. He is willing to do one-on-one -on -one sessions on Zoom. Um, so definitely reach out to him. He's one of, our, um, one of our most popular presenters and we are so grateful to have had him twice in a row. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you, everybody. And you know what? We'll probably do it again next November and December. So join us then. And uh, thank you, Michelle, for moderating. Fantastic job as always. And I'd just like to say to all of you out there, be safe, but get out there and do some shooting, do some happy shooting. And I say, nail it and put it in the bank. Exactly. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next month.